you know, can't emphasize enough the intermediary need to understand the financial markets that they're working in, you know, with, for a carbon commodity, but they also need to understand, you know, the projects and the climate change issues that are being addressed. As we get more and more involved in nature-based solutions, this is going to become paramount. Welcome to Smarter Markets, a weekly podcast featuring the icons and entrepreneurs of technology, commodities and finance, ranting on the inadequacies of our systems and riffing on ideas for how to solve them. Together, we examine the questions, are we facing a crisis of information or a crisis of trust? And will building Smarter Markets be the antidote? Welcome back to Demystifying the Carbon Markets on Smarter Markets. I'm Dave Greeley, Chief Economist at Abex Technologies. Our guest today is Corinne Boone, a true climate market pioneer. Over the past 30 years, Corinne co-founded, built, and managed the global carbon brokerage business at Cantor Fitzgerald, executed numerous innovative multi-million dollar carbon market transactions between global corporations, and advised on the establishment of large climate funds. Corinne is currently group head for the Americas at Air Carbon. Hello, Corinne. Welcome to Smarter Markets. You've been such a pioneer in the carbon markets that many people will unwittingly find themselves walking in your footsteps. That's why I feel so fortunate to be able to get to speak with you today about your experiences, the lessons learned, and what it all means for us now. Like many people getting into carbon markets today, you got involved in climate markets through your work for a large company. Ontario Hydro, which is now Ontario Power Generation, uh, back in the 1990s. Can you start us off today by telling us a little bit about how you got started and what were some of those earliest transactions? Sure. Thanks very much for having me, by the way. It's a pleasure pleasure to be here. I sort of really want to start off by saying I kind of got hooked when I was in university. I took an environmental economics course, and that was at the time that our common future the book, Our Common Future in the Brundtland Commission was coming out and the sustainability became a real topic of the day and you know, understanding that we really need to find a balance between economy, environment and society. And then learning about the fact that we could price pollution as an economist really, really got, I was hooked after that. I thought I've always been somewhat of an environmentalist, but always have wanted to look at these issues and integrate them from a business perspective because what gets measured gets managed. That's always been my, my motto. I was lucky enough when I was went to Ontario Hydro in 1991 that in 1992 I got to work for Morris Strong, who was the the chair of the first United Nations Convention on Climate Change in 1992 in Rio. Came back and started uh, working a lot on climate change and sustainability, as you might know. The Rio Convention led to the actual United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, and every the rest is history. Uh, Ontario Hydro at that time took on a lot of voluntary targets for NOx targets, SO2 targets, and carbon dioxide targets. And I was part of a group uh, that uh, set up the emissions trading function at Ontario Hydro. We were led by a, a real visionary, someone who you might want to interview in the future, a man by the name of Brian Jancy, who really had a lot of great ideas. And together as a team, there were, there were four of us in the beginning. We really... Uh, really started to look at ways in which to use the markets to accomplish environmental objectives, or at least contribute to them. Uh, we, uh, in Ontario, we had the first pilot uh, emission reduction program, which really was a way to look at offset projects, take them through a process for accreditation, for uh, quantification review, and then certification. And that, in, that actually ended up informing a lot of the North American trading scheme. So the the PERT uh, registry, the Pilot Emissions Trading Program, became the Clean Air Canada registry, and then the, the CSA registry for Canada was used as a model by REGI, by NESCOM. Various elements are found in, in it all around the world in offset uh, uh, you know, emission reduction uh, registries. I would have even ventured to say that some of that you know, lent, lent its way into some of the registries that we see today. Uh, some of the early trades that we did I mean, we did some a trade for uh, Richard Sander and his group at that time. They were called Environmental Financial Products, for example, and that was a that was a big trade. That was in 1998. That was called Zapco. We purchased a million tons of carbon credits from 22 landfills across the United States, and that had a real impact on the way in which going through the process of creating the credits and getting those credits quantified and then monetized by selling them to Ontario Power Generation at that time 
it was really a monumental moment and Richard Sander writes about it in his book and it's one of the big, big transactions. And in talking to one of my colleagues the other day, we said it was really one of the trades that influenced the decision to look at ways in which to go forward with the Chicago Climate Exchange. We also were doing trades um, as part of a consortium uh, with the Iowa Farm Bureau in the United States. We were purchasing credits from advanced agricultural practices. We actually did a transaction with DuPont in the 1990s, which led to a transformation in a lot of their technology. And it was an N2O destruction transaction. So that was one of the six gases in the Kyoto Protocol led to DuPont changing their technology around the world and reducing their envir- their carbon emissions associated with one of their production processes. We did smaller trades like Car Heaven, where we worked with to have cars retired across the province, 260,000 of them, a lot of energy efficiency trades, a lot of landfill gas trades across Canada. And all of these transactions are documented in the Canadian, the CSA registry here in Canada, way, spanning way back from the early 90s. You'll see if you go into that registry, all of the transactions. And then the last trade that we did that I was involved with just before I went to my next position was we began a transaction with a big company in the United States that was capturing carbon along its CO2 pipelines in West Texas and then eventually in Wyoming. And that company was then called Petrosource and became to know to have its current name, which is Blue Source. It's amazing because if you if you told me those trades were happening today, I, I wouldn't blink an eye <laughs> to know yeah. that they were happening in the, the late 1990s. It's amazing. Um, and as you said, some of your trades laid the groundwork for the path-breaking Chicago Climate Exchange. And I'm curious, you know, you were working on many of these large transactions, but how was the overall market developing at that time? And what were some of the obstacles that you found yourself encountering? Uh, I think one of the biggest challenges that we found at that point in time is that everything that we were doing was voluntary. You know, there was a lot of, I I don't say market speculation, I say speculation. And, you know, the thinking was that we are going to be living in a carbon constrained future and there will eventually be regulation towards that end. So what can we as industry, you know, those that were forward thinking at the time, you know, there were some indus- some companies and industries that were saying, we just have to keep the doors open. We'll worry about regulation when regulation happens. And then there were other companies that, and institutions and others that really wanted to be early movers and have some influence on the way in which the markets develop. But, you know, the big thing is that it was all voluntary at that point in time. It was being done in the absence of regulation, you know, but it did create a lot of momentum. You know, the Chicago Climate Exchange itself, you know, it was the first real attempt at a trading platform, I mean, I'll, I'll, which I will probably restate in another way when we talk about my next position, which brought together over, you know, 400 participants. They had clearing and settlement. They had a database of all the transactions. You know, it really led to a lot of momentum. They all took on voluntary commitments. But, you know, by 2008, 2009, you know, it was all collapsing because there was a lack of political will. The U.S. had not implemented any regulatory backbone for that. And the participants ultimately lost interest in trading in a voluntary market where they didn't foresee regulations coming. And that was eventually sold. The exchange was eventually sold, as as you probably discussed with others before. But what it really did create was momentum in the absence of, you know, a lot of momentum in the United States, for example. It, It led to the development of a lot of experience by those that were participating, both buyers and sellers and brokers and traders and project developers. And, you know, early action led to a better understanding of what was needed in the policy front. But just like in Canada, we we had a very similar experience. You know, there was a lot of voluntary action in the the 90s leading up to the mid 2000s, you know, and sort of everything kind of came to a halting grind, you know, 2005, 6, 7, because there was no policy certainty, Kyoto Protocol, you know, all of those issues around the U.S. not adopting it, etc. So really what was missing back then was any sort of regulatory certainty and any real big financial player involvement other than the few a few big companies that really saw this as a potential market and that's such an important contrast to today because as you said in the the late 90s and early 2000s much of what was being done was as in anticipation that you would get the government policy and regulations coming and you'd have like these larger robust compliance markets being formed and, and of course, that didn't happen. But you know, now you've got much more the net zero commitments, the stakeholder activism, the ESG movement, where it seems almost it's not necessarily 
private sector moving in anticipation of public sector, but sometimes private sector moving because it's afraid public sector won't or won't move quickly enough. Yeah. You know, I think the big difference from my perspective is that we can now see, you know, we, we always talked about the, you know, what, what might be the damage from, you know, from global warming. You know, there are always kinds of, you know, all kinds of theoretical discussions and the IPCC scientists talking about, you know, the, the earth is warming, global warming is going to cause damage and, you know, there is risk and we need to address it. But I think the difference between when that was being said in the 90s and, and still now to an extent is that we're actually seeing the damage. We can see, you know, the the damage from severe weather events, from floods, from droughts, from disaster. We, we actually can put a, a, a value on it if you look at the insurance, the way insurance companies do their valuation. And we can look at losses, uh, residential, commercial, industrial, institutional. We can actually see this damage. And it's not just a theoretical risk anymore. It's a reality. And corporations are saying, we need to do something about this. This, you know, If we want to be here in the future and be conducting business uh, in a sustainable manner, we need to address climate now. And for me, the game changed when institutional investors uh, grabbed onto that concept and said, you know, if you're not doing something about climate, we're not investing in you. And when, you know, net zero pledges started to become, you know, more and more, I guess the, the question now is is to be able to make sure that net zero pledges aren't just pledges and there's real action behind them. Right. And that's why I think your experience is so helpful. And I want to want to go back in time again a little bit, because back in 2000, you then went to Cantor Fitzgerald and you were co-founding their climate change mitigation brokerage company, CO2E.com, with a focus on the global carbon markets. And I'm fascinated, you know, when you were starting this, what was your vision for that brokerage company and who were your clients and what did you see them needing from you at the time? Yeah, it's, it's very interesting. I mean, it was just uh, going back through my, my notes uh, from back then. And, you know, I have to say, um, you know, CO2E.com was spun off from Cantor Fitzgerald in, in early 2000. Um, Cantor Fitzgerald itself, one of the biggest financial services uh, companies in the world, you know, was heavily involved in the NOx and SO2 and other environmental attribute markets that were highly regulated in the U.S., leader in the SO2 markets, for example. But Carlton Bartels, who was the CEO of CO2E.com and, and the head of the environmental brokerage services at Cantor Fitzgerald at the time, he had a real vision. Um, he was saying back in the late 90s, early 2000s, that this, that ca the carbon markets could be the largest commodity market in the world. Like he was saying that in the 1990s and the early 2000s. Right. And he was, it was his vision that led to the establishment of CO2E.com and and I was one of the founders, along with many others. Sadly, many of them perished in 9-11, including Carlton Bartels. But we founded CO2E.com and we launched it in The Hague at a UN climate convention. The co-founders were Carlton Bartels, Steve Drummond, Adam White, Stuart McCarthy, Nicholas Steen. Nicholas in the UK, still doing lots of interesting carbon stuff. And, you know, again, he predicted that this would be the largest commodity. Carlton predicted this. And he really wanted to, but he saw the challenges. You know, he really said, okay, if, if we want to be successful at addressing climate change, we have to figure out how to do this in a more transparent, more liquid, more efficient manner. And so his vision was to create CO2E.com, which was an electronic trading platform. Not an exchange, but an electronic trading platform for offsets and for allowances. And it was state of the art back then. I mean, some of the big trades, you know, that, that we did, uh, Carlton did trades from 1997 up to 2000, a lot of small, a lot of big. And then CO2E.com was formed in 2000. Our first big trade was the Petrosource trade that we started, which was 1.5 million tons. Big deal back then in the year 2000. Then we did another big trade with them, which was 9 million tons. And uh, I, that was a trade that I brokered through to with BlueSource. And, and I believe that is the largest actual carbon trade. I'm not sure if it still is to date, but I think it might be one of the largest uh, carbon trades uh, that exists for offsets. We did transactions with Transalta, a big Canadian electricity company, with a Chilean agricultural product producer, big methane capture from animal waste. We did transactions in landfills with Chilean clients developing carbon methane capture at landfills, transacting into 
you know, Japan and to Europe. We did transactions with wood waste producers that were selling again into Japan. We did transactions with a huge Ecuadorian company that was selling uh, animal waste you know, methane captured from animal waste again and then turned into compost. And, and we did trades with uh, through a company called EcoInvest, who uh, I'm not sure if you're aware of, but it's actually sort of the company where I met Bill Pazos, who is my current colleague. I did transactions for he and Carlos Martins, who is our Brazilian colleague at uh, ACX Brazil. And we did some transactions in hydro and sugarcane, etc. So many transactions were happening. Most of them at that point in time were into the clean development mechanism market because of the seat of the Kyoto Protocol, but lots of activity during those those days. And for people who don't understand the role of intermediaries in some of these markets, as well as obviously you've experienced, how did the that exchange work for bringing together, you know, it sounds like the project developers bringing together those, whether it was governments or companies that were looking to obtain, you know, some of the credit for the carbon reductions that were, were occurring. What was the role of the intermediaries in bringing those together? And, you know, maybe you could walk us through one of those deals. Sure, sure. No problem. You know, basically, the way that CO2E.com moved forward as a business post 9-11 was really in the OTC market. And, you know, I w- my job at that time with Cantor Fitzgerald is I was head of uh, origination globally. So I was head of the offset or carbon credit creation part of the business. There's a whole other arm of CO2E.com that transacted in the allowance markets and specifically in the European Union emissions trading scheme. So in my role, I had a team of, I think we had about 100 people on our team that were looking for projects and helping clients to get them from project concept or idea uh, right through to successful education, ed- execution of a transaction, and then delivery of carbon credits, and then delivery of payments. So essentially, I would uh, work with clients who, in, you know, in Chile, in Brazil, and like I said, in Ecuador, in Mexico, and even Canada and the U.S. that had uh, ideas and opportunities for projects at landfills, at agricultural facilities, even some nature-based solutions, renewable energy, because renewable energy was uh, viable carbon credit project back then, help them quantify, you know, develop a baseline for a project, you know, because if you're going to be a good broker in the OTC market at that time, and I think still now, you need to understand the market, you need to understand, but you also need to understand climate change, and you need to understand how to create a carbon credit project, because there's a lot of challenges that you face throughout a project. And if you just land on a project developer's doorstep and say, I want to sell your credits, I can get you eight bucks, then you're not a good broker because you have to make help them to ensure that all of their documentation um, from project idea and concept through to the development of a protocol through with an accepted methodology through to uh, submission to a registry to making sure they get through the certification process and coordinating a lot of that getting helping them to get their projects verified and then helping them to figure out who to use for annual monitoring and verification and then undertaking the actual transaction and helping the buyer and seller get to an actual contract that works for both of them. Because as you know, um, each party, the buyer and the seller wants what they want. And the role of the intermediator is to find that sweet spot in the middle where the buyer, um, you know, gets the carbon credits that they're looking for at a price in which they're willing to accept. And the seller gets to undertake their project and sell their credits to, at that point in time, very much it was part of the financing needs for the project. So really helping the the buyer and the seller come to that point in the middle where they can get to a deal and deliver the credits, whether it's through upfront payment, whether it's through, you know, we'd use all the tools in the market. Sometimes, most of the time, we were doing forward transactions. Sometimes we were doing options. Sometimes we were doing puts. Sometimes we were doing calls. You know, a lot of sophisticated transactions. And, and, uh, you know, and it was really the role of the intermediary was, was to understand that and help the clients get to a place where, they both walked away happy. They had a long-term relationship. One had carbon credits and one had revenue for, for their projects. That's so helpful. Um, and today, you know, we see intermediaries in the carbon markets helping to create long-term transactions between the project developers and those end users of carbon credits. We also see short-term trades occurring in carbon offsets after they're created. And I'm curious, you know, from your perspective, what similarities do you see between what's happening now and what was happening back then? 
And, you know, what tools that were developed back then do you still see in use today? Or can we still use today? I mean, I think maybe I'll start out with the easier part. I mean, the short-term transactions or the spot market is easier. If the carbon credits are issued, it's easier to an extent. And, you know, we'll get to that maybe later on in the discussion, which is where the role of exchanges, uh, you know, and uh, like Air Carbon come in, is that they offer a lot more access to project developers that have carbon credits that have been issued or in the spot market and they just want to sell. It's a lot easier to sell spot market credits in general, even if it's over the counter because they're issued. There's a lot less risk associated with them. A buyer knows that the carbon credits are issued. They just have to agree to contractual terms, make payment, take delivery and go forward. It's the forward transactions, you know, where or the, you know, now we're seeing a lot of transactions with companies such as one that you're involved in, like Base Carbon and with others, where you're to some extent, you're you're funding projects that will happen in the future. And, you know, you're paying upfront for a stream of credits that if everything goes well, you will get. And, you know, there's going to be some risk throughout that. So, you know, I think uh, it's still very expensive to undertake these forward types of OTC transactions. See, the, one of the big barriers that, that companies uh, such as Base Carbon and others have addressed in the, in the project-based um, offset market for forward future tons is that, one of the big challenges for project developers in the past, and I think it still exists, and I think it's a gray area that doesn't get discussed much but really needs to be discussed, is that uh, project developers end up giving away the farm, so to speak, to get their project financed but through the sale of carbon credits to some extent. You know, some offset project development companies will come in and say, I'm going to help you develop your carbon credit project. I'm, this is the fee I'm going to charge you for marketing or brokerage, not marketing, but you know, transaction of these tons. But then there's all these other costs in the middle, you know, to get your protocol developed, to develop a contract, to do the verification, to do the monitoring. And that's going to cost X, you know. I've seen it be as much as 20 to 30 percent of a project in terms of the revenue stream in the past, which in my view is not acceptable. And a lot of project developers lost years of streams of revenues as a result of having to pay, you know, um, agree that pro offset product developers would take this payment for developing these projects and then transacting these projects. And that sort of led to a lot of uh, mistrust in the market, for example. I've been involved in many transactions where the, the sellers have just said, or the product developers that had the actual projects have said, it's not worth it for me to go through this process to maybe not get anything at the other end and, and to lose a lot of money. Organizations such as Base Carbon are upfront paying and agreeing on terms for what you will get in the future. And I think that is that is a very positive change, uh, but it's still very expensive and it's also very time consuming. If you're doing a, a typical over-the-counter transaction, you still have to negotiate a contract. You still have to go through all of the process of getting your methodology accepted. If there isn't one, of getting your project registered, there's a huge bottleneck in the registries, Vera particularly, because there's so much activity. A lot of the registries don't have common rules and requirements, even vintages to some extent. There's some, you know, disagreement mm -hmm. around that. But there's also, you know, it, things have changed a lot. Net zero pledges are a reality now and they weren't before. And so that actually leads to a lot of positive opportunity. You know, there is a lot more will other than just political will to try to get to a good deal. Some of the things that we can we can take forward and the tools that have been developed that we should really take advantage of is there were master emission reduction purchase agreements developed in the 1990s and 2000s. And Air Carbon Exchange has one, for example, and AIDA, the International Emissions Trading Association, has developed one. And they should be the base of any carbon credit transaction because a lot of people who have spent a lot of time in these markets on at every point in the market have come together to develop a document that actually can be used to form the basis for a transaction. Um, registries, you know, we should have learned lessons around registries. There's, again, I think I mentioned there's a huge bottleneck and there's a lot of fragmentation. There's not much fungibility. And again, I think I made the point earlier that local communities and the project developers need to be sure to benefit from these projects if they are to go forward. And there's the other thing I think that I would really like to emphasize is there's so much experience, you know, from the CDM market that seems to have been forgotten. You know, there were almost 8,000 CDM projects and 
billions of tons of carbon credits that transacted in the CDM market. And we can take lessons from all of those methodologies that were developed. So those are things that I think we should do. Yeah, and it's so important that we don't spend our time reinventing the wheel and having to, to learn hard lessons all over again. We, we, actually, does, I, <laughs> we actually reinvent the wheel a lot in this. <laughs> and I guess maybe that's, uh, that is one thing that I think, you know, we should take a lesson from and try to, you know, I, I actually think there's a need for a study where we bring together the learnings from all of those and say, what could be the good things we could take from all of that forward when we come out of Glasgow with the new institution? That's a great idea. And I really need to second the, the lesson you kept pointing to, which is that in a lot of these, you know, longer term arrangements, they need to be more than arrangements. They need to be real partnerships. And, you know, as you said, Phil Hardwick, yeah. who was one of our guests, uh, the COO at Base Carbon, emphasized that when you're in these relationships that are going to be transactions occurring, you know, over more than a decade, you need to make sure that there's you know, rewards for everyone. And as you emphasized with intermediaries, it's not about one side winning everything. It's about everybody coming to a point where they're getting their fair share of, you know, uh, of what they need and what they want. So, yeah. And, and I mean, you know, again, you know, can't emphasize enough for the intermediary need to understand the financial markets that they're working in, you know, with, for a carbon commodity, but they also need to understand you know, the projects and the climate change issues that are being addressed. As we get more and more involved in nature-based solutions, this is going to become paramount. Yeah. And, you know, maybe I'll come back one more time because I think you may have answered this already, but, you know, I just wanted to try to put a point on what role do you think that intermediaries should be playing in the carbon markets to make the markets as a whole, not just the intermediary, but the markets as a whole successful? So I know you've, you've emphasized part of it is them, you know, really understanding both the physical business, the science and their clients. But I'm curious if there's any other things that would stand out to you. Um, I guess, uh, you know, and, and I sort of differentiate sort of exchanges from intermediaries. But, you know, again, I can't emphasize like what you just said, understanding, you know, the market and the climate issue. Understanding the needs of the clients, too. I mean, not all clients have the same needs. There's a lot of product or developers out there that really don't need money to finance their projects. They just want to sell a stream of carbon, which then calls into question all of these issues around additionality, right? But, you know, but there are some carbon, some project developers out there that really need the money and oftentimes need the money up front to actually develop the project. And, and they also need help. They don't, you know, you know, we, we hear about carbon credit projects and the potential to sell carbon credits and make money that can finance projects. And, and a lot of these projects don't can't meet a certain hurdle rate. But then you say to them, OK, well, I, I'm going to be your intermediary and, and but you're going to have to develop a protocol. You're going to have to, you know, do a baseline. You're going to have to submit it for verification. You're going to have to do monitoring. You have to submit it to a registry. You have to sign an agreement and negotiate it. You have to annually monitor. And they're like, what? Like, I don't you know. So the role of the intermediary is to help clients understand like understand what all of this involves because it's not rocket science, but it's not easy, right? In order to get to a successful carbon market transaction, there's a lot of work involved, you know, from buyers, from sellers, from EDM areas, from, from consultants that do, you know, good project documentation, from consultants that do monitoring and verification reports, and then the whole registry review process. And so really understanding that. And you know, we need to understand this because it's not going to change. There's always going to be an OTC market because we want good carbon credit projects to go forward. And that means there's always going to be a forward market. You raised a great point of so many people that are, you know, in the project development space, you know, they come to it from the, the mindset of a scientist or an engineer or a conservationist. And they don't necessarily know, nor should they know. Like they're not <laughs> lawyers necessarily. They're not financial market, you know, not familiar with financial market regulations and procedures. And so there's also this process to bring together those different types of knowledge and those different ways of thinking to make these markets successful. And, you know, I wanted to close out today. I, we've talked so much about the past, you know, 20 plus years, but today your group head for the Americas at Air Carbon. And I was curious, how do you see this ecosystem of exchanges, spot exchanges like Air Carbon and other intermediaries developing? And where do we need to go next if we're going to create markets capable of meeting the commercial needs of the net zero movement? 
I mean, I, you know, just like I think maybe go back to almost the beginning to the end. I mean, it's just like what Carlton Bartels was saying, you know, with his vision for CO2E.com. He recognized the need and Richard Sander to some extent as well, because he recognized the need to make enable these markets to be highly liquid by putting them on electronic trading platforms or putting them on exchanges, much of which had many similarities, because the typical OTC market is not transparent, it's not efficient, it's expensive, it takes a long time, sellers don't have access to a full market, you know, and on and on and on. And, you know, when I was approached by Bill Pazos about potentially joining Air Carbon, I was like, this is a breath of fresh air, because this is what we've been talking about forever, you know, the need to facilitate, you know, the possibility to have a highly liquid, fungible, efficient, transparent, trackable, traceable carbon market. And Air, Car Air Carbon Exchange, that's exactly what Air Carbon Exchange does. So you bring together two great minds of industry, Bill Pazos, who understands climate change, Tom McMahon, who understands financial markets. You bring them together, they have a vision and they develop an electronic blockchain-based exchange. And the beauty of the blockchain is that there's always a historical ledger of each and every transaction. So transparently exists immediately. It also, you know, exchanges also open up a whole new world for sellers and for buyers. Instead of negotiating through a lawyer or through a project developer with maybe, you know, one or two potential buyers that were, you know, identified and contacted through a term sheet, you know, that then takes months to negotiate, they just onboard onto Air Carbon Exchange, you know, once they've got, you know, if they're in the spot market and, you know, we can talk a bit more about the futures, but... And they've got immediately, they've got access to a whole ream of potential buyers if they're a seller. And on the other side, you know, and they've all been cleared. They've all gone through a know your client process. They've all, you know, there's a trustee in the middle. There's where bank, air carbon exchange is bankruptcy remote. So there's, you know, the risk is pretty much taken out of the equation for both buyers and sellers. They can go in, they can, you know, if you look at our, our trading platform, the exchange, it's at every every token that we develop on Air Carbon Exchange is, is asset backed by a ton of carbon. So it's real. We use the blockchain for good. We use it to actually be able to trace. Uh, transactions clear immediately. Transaction settles. The buyer, the seller delivers. The buyer pays and everybody is whole. And it happens, you know, the transaction can clear within seconds on a, on a, on a carbon exchange instead of within months or even sometimes years in the OTC market. But the other thing is, you know, regulation will be key. You know, as, as you've seen and we've all heard recently, there's the SEC has come out, you know, talking about reporting and disclosure. You know, there have been all kinds of calls for regulation in the carbon market. Canada is looking at different ways of regulation. Um, Europe is already regulating carbon. So there's, you know, we are going to be in a regulated market. So the use of market tools such as exchanges is an obvious and natural way to go. And, you know, as we, we look at, you know, the forward market, uh, even the CDM market currently, but the forward market for Article 6.4 under Glasgow, exchanges can link up domestically and internationally to each and every exchange, whether it be a developing country, any country that has a compliance obligation that is allowing for carbon credits to be transacted internationally as part of their their requirements, we can link up to that. But Exchanges really add an extra level of credibility to this market and speed, efficiency, and transparency and quality. And it's really the way of the future. And carbon will be a commodity and carbon will be the biggest, the largest commodity market in the world. It could even be its own asset class. Thanks again to Corinne Boone, a true carbon market pioneer and current group head for the Americas at Air Carbon. We hope you enjoyed the episode. Join us next week with our guest, Barbara Barzma, CEO of the Rabo Carbon Bank, which is working with clients to accelerate sustainable food production through regenerative farming and other initiatives that reduce and remove carbon emissions from the atmosphere. That concludes this week's episode of Smarter Markets by ABAX. For episode transcripts and additional episode information, including research, editorial, and video content, please visit smartermarkets.media. Smarter Markets is 100% listener-driven, so please help more people discover the podcast by leaving a review on Apple Podcast, Spotify, YouTube, or your favorite podcast platform. Smarter Markets is presented for informational and entertainment purposes only. 
the information presented on Smarter Markets should not be construed as investment advice. Always consult a licensed investment professional before making investment decisions. The views and opinions expressed on Smarter Markets are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect those of the show's hosts or producer. Smarter Markets, its hosts, guests, employees and producer, Abax Technologies, shall not be held liable for losses resulting from investment decisions based on informational viewpoints presented on Smarter Markets. Thank you for listening and please join us again next week.